as usual, what's coming around is two things. There's the actual hadith with uh, talking points, and then the second is a handout that has more details. Anyone who is missing uh, handouts, I guess some way we have to facilitate it, but if we had your email addresses, we could actually send those things to you as attachments. Just put that in mind. Maybe in the future we'll organize a way. Maybe I'll pass around like a blank paper or something and just have you neatly put your email address with your name. And then uh, I could actually send you some of the previous notes. And you should go over them. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, so tonight, tonight's hadith is hadith 25. And this, this hadith is right on time. MashaAllah, we're entering into the month of Dhul-Hijjah as of now. And uh, tonight's hadith is timely. We'll see, inshaAllah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'a huda. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا in the name of Allah all praise is due to Allah and may the salat and salam of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad his household his companions and everyone who follows them in righteousness until the last day. Again, tonight we are studying Hadith 25. I don't know if you are reading these Hadith before you come to the class, but anyone who's paying attention, this Hadith 25 is narrated by Abu Dhar, who, who is also the same Sahabi who narrated last week's Hadith, Hadith 24. And it's not a coincidence that and now we put these two Hadith back to back like this. Right? Hadith 24. The main theme is dua making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you're going to see tonight, the main theme of this hadith is a dhikr remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to share something with you. It's in the notes there. It's something that's from the, the muqaddimah, the introduction to a Nawi 40 hadith. Sometimes we have to go back to the introduction. Never sleep on the introduction. The introduction is where the author is giving you the thesis, a snapshot. And this statement of Anoa is in the introduction. It is, it is a beautiful statement and it's something that we have to pay close attention to. Anoa, he said in his introduction, he said, وَيَنْبَغِي لِكُلِّ رَاغِبْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَنْ يَعْرِفْ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ لما اشتملت عليه من المهمات واحتوت عليه من التنديد على جميع الطاعات وذلك لمن تدبره. He said everyone who desires the hereafter ought to know these hadith for they for what they contain of important information because they alert one of all the acts of obedience to Allah which is clear to whoever reflects upon them. Or on this book. That's, and, and this is the answer to a question that came when we first started this class. Someone, a brother, was sitting over here on the wall and he asked, Why is it that the scholars give so much attention to these ahadith? Right? And no, we are saying that anyone who desires the akhirah, anyone who is concerned about the akhirah, he needs to know these ahadith. It's like a road map. It's like a road map. Route 40. Route 40, huh? It gives you everything, mashallah, as you're going to see uh, as we're going through this book, including tonight's hadith. Anyways, the hadith, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he says, and Allah be pleased with him, anna unasan, and in another narration, anna nasan, min ashabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qalu lin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya Rasulullah, ذهب أهل الدثور بالأجور يصلون كما نصلي 
ويصومون كما نصوم ويتصدقون بفضول أموالهم قال أو ليس قد جعل الله لكم ما تصدقون إن بكل تسبيحة صدقة وكل تكبيرة صدقة وكل تحميدة صدقة وكل تهليلة صدقة وأمر بالمعروف صدقة ونهي عن منكر صدقة وفي بضع أحدكم صدقة قالوا يا رسول الله أيأتي أحدنا شهوته ويكون له فيها أجر قال أرأيتم لو وضعها في حرام أكان عليه وزر فكذلك إذا وضعها في الحلال كان له أجر رواه مصر Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he said, Some people from the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, the affluent have made off with their rewards. They pray as we pray, they fast as we fast, and they give in charity the best of their wealth. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Has not Allah made things for you to give charity? Verily, every tasbiha is a sadaqah. Every takbira is a sadaqah, every tahmida is a sadaqah, and every tahleela is a sadaqah. And joining the good is sadaqah, forbidding the evil is a sadaqah, and in the sexual act of each of you with his spouse is a sadaqah. They said, oh Messenger of Allah, when one of us fulfills his desire, will he be rewarded for that? He said, do you not think that were you to fulfill it unlawfully, he would earn a sin? So similarly, if he was to fulfill his desire lawfully, he would be rewarded. Why? This is a tremendous hadith. This hadith, wallahi, is tremendous and it's on time. It is on time. Um, first of all, let's clarify something. When he said some people came to the Prophet ﷺ, these people, according to another, another riwayah of this hadith, these were fuqaha min al muhajirin These were poor migrants. When the Muhajirun migrated from Mecca to Medina al-Amr in the beginning, they were poor. Why? They left everything behind. They left with the clothes on their backs. So the Ansar, they were well off. They were better off than the Muhajirun. Right? They were established. They didn't leave their home. They were there. The Muhajirun initially, many of them, they were uh, poor. And so, the Sahaba, subhanAllah, pay attention to this, Ya Ikhwan. May Allah be pleased with the Sahaba. They are the best of this Ummah Allah. They are, they understood that the Asla concerning Sadaqah is that it is to be given with mad, it's to be given with money. That's the Asla. That is the origin, that's the foundation, right? So they're saying, the people who have a lot of wealth, they have, they have gone and they have they pray the way we pray, they fast the way we fast, right? They do all these things. And they gave sadaqah with the fudul, which is the surplus of their wealth. Alright? It is as if they're saying, Oh Messenger of Allah, how do we compete with them? This is the attitude of the Sahaba. The Sahaba, they didn't, they didn't sit on the sidelines. Yani, when Allah says, فَاسْتَبِقُ khairat," You know, hasten to do the good. They were always, they wanted to be first in doing that. Right? So they're saying, you know, we are the same with those other people, except they have something over us. They have wealth. And they're given with the surplus of their wealth. So the Prophet ﷺ responded to them by saying, Has not Allah given you things? Has He not made for you things with which you can give charity? And then He went on to explain every tasbiha. Tasbiha is to say, Subhanallah. Every tasbiha is a sadaqah. Every tahmida, alhamdulillah, saying alhamdulillah is a sadaqah. Every takbira, every time you say Allahu Akbar is a sadaqah. Every tahleela, every time you say la ilaha illallah is a sadaqah. Right? And then he said, and enjoining the good is a sadaqah. Forbidding the evil is a sadaqah as well as having lawful relations with your spouse. 
a man with his wife, a wife with her husband, there is a sadaqah in that. If you pay attention, the Prophet ﷺ gave them two different types of sadaqah. The sadaqah that you do to yourself, and the sadaqah that you do towards others. Saying, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, this is for you. As for enjoying the good and forbidding the evil and having relations with your spouse, that sadaqah goes to someone else. So he gave them two different types of sadaqah. And then they said, O Messenger of Allah, will one of us be rewarded for fulfilling his desire? He said, were you to fulfill that desire in the haram, you would get a sin. So similarly, uh, you fulfill that desire and what is halal, you get a reward. One of the current scholars who's living, Sheikh uh, Abdul Salam al Shuwayri, <laughs> Hafizullah. He's mashallah strong. This man is a faqih. He's amazing. He has a complete explanation of the 40 hadith. It's available on YouTube. And I'm telling you this because you should, you should listen to these things before coming to class, even. You know, just to, even myself. This is not the first time I'm going through this, but every time I'm teaching this class, I, I prepare for the class. I go and listen to and read and I listen to different things. And he said something that is amazing in his explanation. He said, he said, Al-Mu'minun min Ummati Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hum aqalun nas a'mara The believers from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when in comparison to the other nations, they have the shortest lifespans. وَأَعْذَمُهُمْ ujura, But they have the greatest reward. وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ دُخُولًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ And this ummah, there is no other ummah that will have more people entering Jannah besides this ummah. The Prophet ﷺ said about this ummah, that this ummah will be thuluth. Ahlul Jannah. It will be one third of the people of Jannah. Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu <coughs> will make up one third of the people of Jannah. The Shaykh, he said, Hafizahullah, he said, Bisabbi anna Allah Azza wa Jal yuthibuhum ala kathir min al adat yuqalibuha ila ibadat. He mentions two reasons why. Why is it that this Ummah they're going to be the most of the people in Jannah in terms of nations. And why is it that their reward is greater? He said because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the people of this ummah for many actions that are considered to be adat, habits, habitual acts. And, but because of the intention, right? The first hadith in the 40 hadith, in the mal'a'mal bin niyan. We said before, the intention can change if you, if you look at it, it can take an action that is an aada, a habit, and it can promote it. It can promote it. It can move, it can move from being a habit, a habitual act, to a bad. For example, eating, sleeping, drinking, these are all aadats. These are natural things. We have to do it. Even the kuffar do that. However, the believer, if he eats with the intention uh, of sustaining his body, he drinks with the intention to preserve his health. He sleeps with the intention to get up on time to pray the night prayer. He has relations with his spouse, as is mentioned in this hadith, with the intention to guard his chastity, to guard her chastity, to increase the number of the ummah. If this is the intention, his reward, now these acts that are adat, they now become ibadat, they become acts of worship. So this is one reason why. And then he mentioned something else. And it is relevant to these days that we're in right now. He said, Wal Amr Athani in the second matter, and Allah Ja'alahum Mawasim Mina Ta'a to Da'afu Fiha al Ujur Udilla Anha Man Kabalana Mithla Yomil Jumu'a wa Layla Til Khabir. He said, Hafidullah, may Allah preserve him. He said, Allah has made for this Ummah Mawasim seasons. Seasons wherein acts of obedience to da'af, they are multiplied. They are multiplied. And <coughs> this Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
blessed all this favor on us Ummah because the previous nations, some of these things that the previous nations were not previewed to. For example, Yom al Jum'ah. The Jews, they worship on the day of Saturday. The Christians, they worship on the day Sunday. But the best day of the week is Jum'ah. Yom al Jum'ah. Allah guided this Ummah to Yom al Jum'ah. It's the best day uh, of the days of the week. And it is an hour wherein no one supplicates to Allah and asks Allah for something except that Allah gives it to him. Likewise, Laylatul Qadr. The previous nations, they didn't know about Laylatul Qadr. That's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made known to this ummah. And we said previously before, as Allah mentions in the Quran, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahar. Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, is better than a thousand months. That equals 83 years and four months. So just one night is equivalent to a whole lifetime. 83 years and four months. Imagine if you are fasting and doing ibadah. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 40 years. Fasting Ramadan, doing these acts, and each time you catch Laylatul Qadr, you multiply that, you do the math. Allahu Akbar. So, It's important that we be mindful of these things and we don't take them for granted. That we don't belittle them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, The most beloved of speech to Allah are four. SubhanAllah, Walhamdulillah, Wa La Ilaha Illallah, Wallahu Akbar. Yani, did you hear the word? Ahabbu. Ahabbu al kalam. This is called ismu tafdil, the superlative noun. The most beloved of speech. The most be beloved of kalam. This is the dhikr. This is the dhikr. We already spoke about in hadith 23. Right? We're in uh, hadith of Abu Darda. Where in the Prophet ﷺ said, iman. Purification is half of iman. Walhamdulillah, tamla ul mizan. Saying alhamdulillah, it fills the scales. Wa subhanallah, walhamdulillah, tamla ali, aw tamla u. Ma bayna samawati wal ar. And saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, they fill all the space that is in and in between the heavens and the earth. In other words, if subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, could take on a shape, if it could take on it, it would fill all of this, everything. So if you know that, how can we not be saying these things? When you're in the car at the red light, when you're moving in the car on the way home, on the way to work, when you're in the school, when you're just sitting in the masjid waiting for the salah, how can you not be making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet Sallallahu said, as we went over before, the last hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Kalimatani, Khafifatani, Ala Lisani, Faqilatani, Filmizani, Habibatani, Ila Rahman. Two words are light on the tongue, heavy on the scale, beloved to Al Rahman, Subhanallah, wa bihamdi, wa Subhanallah al Azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, wa Subhanallah al Azim. Look at this hadith, An, an Abi Darda, radiallahu anhu. Abu Darda, he narrated the hadith. This hadith too, this hadith is sahih, it's collected by Imam Ahmed and Al-Tirmidhi. The Prophet Sallallahu said, أَلَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ Shall I not inform you of the best of your actions? وَأَزْكَاهَا عِنْدَ مَلِيكِكُمْ And the most, or, and, and which are the purest to your Lord? وَأَرْفَعُهَا فِي دَرَجَاتِكُمْ Which exalt you to the high ranks? وَخَيْرٌ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِنْفَاقِ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ And that are better for you than spending gold and silver. وَخَيْرٌ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْ تَلْقُوا عَدُوَّكُمْ فَتُدْرِبُوا فَتَدْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَهُمْ وَيَضْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَهُمْ أَعْنَاقَكُمْ And it is better than you were to meet your enemies and strike their faces and for your enemies to strike your faces. So I not inform you, what's better than all of that? What do you think they said? They didn't say na'am, they said bala. Bala, of course, please tell us. What is that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Dhikrullahi Azza wa Jal. 
Dhikrullahi Azza wa Jal. Remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal, the mighty and majestic. SubhanAllah. So he gave us an example in this hadith. It's better. Dhikr of Allah is better than all of that. And remember last week we said, for those brothers and sisters who are going to make Hajj, this is what you should be doing during Hajj. If you want your 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 ajab, you want your your reward to be so great. Some people, we have to have high aspirations. Don't go with just the attitude, I just want my Hajj to be accepted. You don't just want your Hajj to be accepted. You also want to get edge of so much reward there. It doesn't stop there. A believer has ruluul himma, high aspiration. High aspiration. What is it that's going to make that reward so great? Remember on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these days that we're in right now, these days, ayyam al ashr these are the days of dhikr, lots of dhikr. Right? Dhikr during the days that Allah referred to as ma'lumat, and the days that are referred to as ma'dudat. Ma'lumat, those are the ten days. Ma'dudat, those are the three days. Ayyam al tashriq Doing a lot of dhikr of Allah. A lot of dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال الله تعالى الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب those who believe and those whose hearts find comfort in the remembrance of Allah surely in the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find comfort قال أهل العلم the people of knowledge they say ذكر الله تعالى أيسر العمل جهدا remembering Allah is the easiest of actions in terms of effort وَأَعْظَمُهُ ثَوَابًا And it is the greatest of actions in terms of reward. وَأَسْرَعُهُ عَلَى الْقَلْبِ أَثَرًا And it is the quickest. It is the most expeditious as it relates to having an effect and influence on the heart. Dhikrullah. Every time you remember Allah, you polish uh, that heart of yours. Remembrance of Allah, Ya Ikhwan, it's all about that. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, Dhikrullah aslun. Remembrance of Allah is a foundation for repelling the lurking whisperer as shaitan. It is the foundation for repelling him. That shaitan, if a person's heart is, is constantly remembering Allah, it's very, very hard for shaitan to enter into this person, to do anything with him. But as soon as you become heedless, ghafil, Unaware, not thinking about Allah, that is when you become vulnerable. That is when the shaitan can enter upon you. Because what does that tell you about us and our families and our children? Our children have to be busy. They have to be busy with zikrullah. In the masajid programs, reading Quran, uh, learning good things. Why? If you keep them busy with that, it becomes very hard for shaitan to get to them. But if they're idle, you know what idle means? Just standing there doing nothing? What? They have too much free time on their hands, shaitan get to them, and who knows, maybe you will not be able to get to them again. Right? Okay. So in this hadith, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, the companions who were asking the Prophet ﷺ, what is it, what is it, you know, what is left for us? How can we compete with those? That is because they were thinking about the asl of sadaqah, which is giving wealth. Which goes to say that that has a very high status in Islam. Given salakah with wealth, without a doubt, the Sahaba considered it to be a big deal. It is a big deal. And it's something that we should do. Especially when it comes to the masajid, for example. Especially in countries like this here in America. Where you don't have an Islamic treasury department financing masajid. It's all on us to take care of these masajid. And these 10 days of the Hijjah, any day of the year, but these days, these are the days when the, the actions, the righteous deeds are, are multiplied. They are most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think of that, be mindful of that. In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu taught the Sahaba other ways of getting the reward of doing sadaqah. So sadaqah is of two types. There's the sadaqah that is khasa, the specific, which is giving wealth. And then there is the sadaqah that is am, that is general, which includes all acts, all good deeds. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, 
La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and being regular in it. The last hadith that we're going to talk about, which is hadith number 50, the Prophet ﷺ told the companion Abdullah ibn Busuf, he said, don't let your tongue cease being wet from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, always do it. Never belittle this. Never belittle dhikrullah. I'm telling you, Ya Ikhwan. When you're in your car, we have a lot of downtime. We have more free time than we actually realize. Even in your workplace, and you're at your desk, make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be in the habit of doing that. Okay, moving on. Next thing I want to talk about is the, the, the Prophet said in this hadith that a person enjoining the good is sadaqah and forbidding the evil is sadaqah. This is one of those areas where you don't see, we, are, we have become, you know, this has become something strange in these times that we live in, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Um, this is something that should be normal in the life of a Muslim. First and foremost with his family. Enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Teaching them. Right? Teaching them. Educating them. Correcting them when they're doing wrong. Uh, and the, the other family members. You have the immediate family members, the other family members. Also within the community. Enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. This is very, very important. These days that we live in, it has become, in some instances, almost like a crime to enjoy the good and the evil. Um, so much so, the month that we're in right now, June, the month of June, these people in this country, they have, uh, in Western countries, they call this the Gay Pride Month. They've given it a month. And they don't have any shyness with it. They talk about it, they boast about it. Even the games that are out, they put the rainbow colors in there for the kids so they can send these subliminal messages. And they have people so afraid that no one wants to talk about it because people are afraid. Oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be accused of being a homophobe. Huh? They call you a homophobe. Huh? Homophobe, meaning you, you have hatred and fear of homos, the likes of these things. As Muslims, we have to talk about these things. And we, don't, we talk about it with, with ilm, not with emotions, not with recklessness, you know? Obviously, we're not, uh, calling to or promoting that people harm people or anything like this, but we have to educate our families and our children about these things. We live in this country, we have to talk about it. No matter how uncomfortable the conversation is, we have to talk about it, because if you don't talk about it, guess what? Other people are talking about it. They're talking about it. In the school, they're talking about it. Your, your sons and your daughters are hearing about it. You have to talk about these things. You have to talk to your sons about how to dress properly that we should wear clothes that are clearly for men and our daughters should wear clothes that are clearly for women. Right? Because these people, they have an agenda. They're trying to make the lines blurry. They have male, female, and then they have something in between. Even the bathrooms now. They have, they have a bathroom now in many places called, uh, what do they call that bathroom? Co -ed. It's co-ed, but they don't use the word co-ed, I don't think. What does they use it? There's a, there's a term, and they don't say all gender. It says all gender? Yeah, so you got men's bathroom, you got women's bathroom, and then you got the in between. They want everybody to be here in between. No more on the right or on the left. You got to be here. You know? They want you here. Those things we have to talk about. Allah talks about that very clearly in the Quran with any, no ambiguity. No room for anyone to say, oh, well, you know. No, it's very, very clear. Allah talks about that action, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those people who were involved in that. Anyways, the point I'm, I'm, I'm getting at is that enjoining the good and forbidding the evil is sadaqah. And it is a sadaqah for you. It is a sadaqah for the, the one you're directing your nasiha to. And it is a sadaqah for the entire society. Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, what means, beware of a fitna that is not restricted to those who do wrong amongst you. 
In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Order the good and forbid the evil. I'm sorry, he said, Either you order the good and forbid the evil, or a time will come when a man will raise his hands and say, Oh Allah, oh Allah, and Allah will not respond to his dua. Allah will not respond to his dua. When we enjoin the good and forbid the evil, that is actually himaya. That's a protection for the entire society. It is because of those who enjoin the good and forbid the evil that many of the punishments of Allah are kept back, held back from the people. And when people stop enjoying the good and forbid the evil, then that it's like them that they're 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 opening a door for that punishment to come to them. So this is very important. Enjoying the good and forbid the evil, first and foremost, with ourselves and our families. We shouldn't be like those who want to go out and enjoy the good on the rest of the community and the society and in your own home you have, you want to move, as the, one, as the people say, you want to remove the flies from in front of other people's nose and you have scorpions at your feet. <laughs> you know, subhanAllah. You have to check your home, your wife, your children and the, and the rest of the society. Moving on, the Prophet Sallallahu he also mentioned here that even and one of you having relations with his wife, with his spouse. There is a sabaka in that. There is a sabaka in that. Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, rahimahullah, is one of the big Hanbali scholars. He wrote a very beautiful, he wrote many books, especially in the area of fiqh. He has a book called Al-Mughni. And in this book, he talks about marital relations. He mentions that uh, when, um, when a husband goes to his wife, he should not go to her the way a camel goes to the female camel. In other words, he should have some muqaddimat, introductions, saying nice words, saying nice things. Sometimes we don't do nice things with our, our wives. You know, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his wedding night with Aisha radiallahu anha, you know, with the cup. You heard the narration about the cup, how he, how he drank uh, from the cup and then he gave it to her and then she drank from the cup from the same place he put his mouth. I and mean, these type of things, getting uh, gifts for your wife and saying nice things to her, buying nice things for her, all of that is sadaqah. The Prophet said, even the food you put in your wife's mouth is sadaqah. Yes, the best sadaqah in one hadith, the best sadaqah is the sadaqah you spend at home. Doing nice things for your wife, having relations with the wife. Now, I don't want to dwell on that, but what I do want to talk about is something very important in this hadith. And that is the issue of this hadith the scholars use as a proof for al-qiyas. Who, who knows what Al-Qiyas is? Who can tell us what is Al-Qiyas? You ever heard the word Al-Qiyas? Al-Qiyas, anyone? Uh, similarly with the other rulings, we take extract from the other rulings. So Al-Qiyas, a good way to translate it is a uh, comparative analogy. Some people say analytical analogy. I actually uh, used to use that translation. One brother, he corrected me, and then mashallah, when he corrected me, it, it makes sense. Abu Abad, actually. Abu Abad, he corrected me just recently. He said, don't use this analytical, uh, 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 analytical deduction. Use comparative analogy. And it makes sense. Why? Because in Islam, we have the usul. We have four areas of our Sharia, which the scholars generally agree upon. The first, the first three, there's no difference about that. That is one, the Quran, right? The Sunnah, and then we have what's called al ijma scholarly consensus. That is a hujjah, that's a proof in our religion. The Prophet said, La tajtami'u ummati ala dalala. My ummah will never agree upon an error. This hadith is in uh, the jami' of Imam al-Tirmidhi. Alright? Also Allah says, uh, 
وَإِن تَنَعْزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فُرُضُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ He said, if you differ in anything amongst yourselves, refer back to Allah and His Messenger. The scholars, they said, Allah ordered us to refer back to Allah and His Messenger. If we differ, that means if we agree, it must be haq. Ibn Thaymin, rahimahullah, he mentioned this as well in, uh, in multiple books and places of his. Anyways, these three, the scholars, alhamdulillah, they agree upon the fourth one, which is Al-Qiyas, the Jumhur, the Hanafis, the Hanbalis, the Malikis, the Shafi'is, they agree that Qiyas, this is correct. However, Ibn Hazm, he disagreed. Strongly, he disagreed. Ibn Hazm does not accept, he doesn't agree with Qiyas at all. Right? Rahmatullah Ibn Hazm was a great scholar, by the way. Some people talk bad about Ibn Hazm. He was a big Imam. No, no, not Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm was from Spain, Al-Andalus. He is considered to, if the scholars say if there was a fifth madhab, his madhab would have been the fifth. It's called the Zahiriya. If you ever hear someone say, this is from the Zahiri school of thought, Ibn Hazm was the imam of that, that area. He did not accept Al-Qiyas. However, the majority of the scholars accept Al-Qiyas, and it is very, very important. Why? Because Al-Qiyas helps us to arrive at rulings regarding contemporary new issues that perhaps did not exist during the time of the Prophet Let me give you an example to make it clear, inshaAllah. In the Quran, Allah is very clear that khamr, intoxicants, are what? Haram, it's prohibited, right? So let's say today in uh, 2024, they come with, the people come with something, some new substance. It didn't exist during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they didn't use it. However, it has the same description, the same characteristics as what was already mentioned in the Quran. The scholars will utilize Al-Qiyas to arrive at a ruling regarding that. So they would say, it's description matches the description of such and such that was mentioned in the Quran, for example, Khamar. And so therefore the hukum, the ruling that Allah gave to Khamar, we're going to take that same hukum and apply it to this thing. That's called Al-Qiyas. This, this is a, a good example of cigarettes. People weren't smoking cigarettes during the time of the Prophet That's a relatively new thing. So much so that when they first appeared, there was some ikhtilaf amongst the scholars because they didn't know about it when it first appeared as much as we know about it now. Now, I don't know of anyone who differs about cigarettes. I don't know any scholar who differs. It says, or any scholar who says it's, it's okay, it's No, it's haram. Clearly haram, for a number of reasons. It's a, it's a wasting of wealth. It causes sickness, cancer, which can lead to death. Right? Addiction. And so many other things. Right? So sorry. You hear a lot of people that uh, are in, they're asking about the smoking is a macro tanji. Macro tanji? Yeah. They made this. So this is uh, go with their pig, uh, their uh, yes. yes? No. We, we don't go with that. The Prophet Sallallahu there's too many evidences, too many evidences. And there's too much that we know about cigarettes to believe that it's macro. It kills. What is the disease that is associated with cigarette smoking? There's a whole, there's a disease for it. What is it called? Lung cancer. Lung cancer? But what is the other one? Uh, not eczema. Uh, uh, emphysema. 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 If, if someone has emphysema nine times out of ten, it was because he was smoking. Lung cancer. You ever see the picture of the lungs of the person who smokes? How can someone say it's macro? With what intellect? No, they don't say Matlu. They say Matlu Tanji. They made it. They make a new category, huh? Yeah. Uh, listen, no, alhamdulillah, this issue is clear. But the point, and I don't want to dwell on it, the point I want to make is that this is Qiyas. The Prophet ﷺ used Qiyas in this hadith. This Qiyas is called Al Qiyas Al Aqs, the Qiyas of, of opposites. How is that? He said, in one of you having relations with his spouse, there is a, there is a 
sadaqah. The companions, they said, will one of us get a reward for fulfilling his shahwa, for fulfilling his desire? The Prophet ﷺ said, do you not see that if he were to fulfill that desire in doing haram, he would get wisdom, he would get a sin. Similarly, he fulfilled that in halal, he gets a reward. This is an example of um, al-qiyas, and this is important. You should know this as people who are trying to be students of knowledge. You should know that al-qiyas is a part of the sharia. Ah, and it is something that is often utilized. It is very, very important. It is very, very important because it helps us deal with contemporary new issues. Anything that comes up now new, no one can say there's no hukum for it in Islam because that didn't exist on the time of the Prophet. No. Absolutely, that's wrong. There is a hukum for everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't leave anything except that there is a hukum. There is a ruling for it. <coughs> Alright? However, obviously it's not for me and it's not for you to arrive at that ruling. It's for the who? The scholars. Al-ulama. The scholars. We have any questions thus far? Yes. Question, uh-huh. Imam say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made in Noor. He's made from Noor. Noor. In other words, he said he knows the Gaib. In the Surah of Nashtaya, who in the Mabashar of Mishpuna, 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 who in the Many ayat Allah says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not made in Noor. Exactly. Who follow the Imam and Salah behind his him, he is an Imam of Burzi. You're asking, is it permissible to pray behind a person like this? Yeah. Is it permissible to pray behind someone who believes that uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa knows the unseen? That's the question. That's the question. Huh? Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. Uh, hmm? Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. As a Muslim, you should try to, according to your ability, pray in the masajid where the people are upon tawheed and they are away from bid'ah. However, this is very important. This, as a Muslim, you should do this. You should increase the numbers and the masajid of people of Sunnah. However, let's say you're traveling, right? And there's a masjid there. Even if there's people may have some bid'ah with them, the salah behind someone who is a muqtadir, the salah itself is sahih, is valid. Until and unless someone made takfir on the person, we treat him as a Muslim. He's Muslim. We're not, uh, even, even if people have some shirkiyat with them and some bid'iyat, we, Ahl Sunnah, we are not quick to make takfir on people. That has conditions and it has shuru. But we should try to avoid these things. Like, like for example, there's one masjid here in Buffalo where they have, they have uh, on the top of the masjid, they have what they call the footprints of the Prophet ﷺ. Ever since I saw that, I never went back to that masjid. I would not pray in there. But I don't say that salah behind them is not valid. They're Muslim. They just have some mukhalifat, some things that are opposing. Uh, there are a lot of Muslims who believe that the Prophet ﷺ was created from Noor. And they base it on some weak hadith, or fabricated hadith. They have a lot of things like that. They have a, They have a a, a, a nasheed, or a, they call it dua, what is it, darud or sharif or something like that. And then it, it, it say Muhammad ibn Abdullah, a'udhu billah, nurun min nurillah. Right? This is all wrong. This is wrong. And a lot of times they base these things off of weak and fabricated hadith. Right? Some of them, uh, there's a hadith that says that uh, when Allah created Adam, when he opened his eyes, 
the first thing he saw was Muhammad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, la la ma this, this this hadith is uh, fabricated. This is not correct, and they believe in it. This is another reason why we have to stick to books that are the authors focus on siha, authenticity, and stay away from books that are known for the author. He was not uh, very serious about authenticity, like that book Fada al Amal. They call it Tabligi Nisa. I used to read this book. I used to be with Jamaat al Tabligh, just for a little bit. I used to be with them. And they read from this book. We used to always tell the, the, the brothers, MashaAllah, when Allah guided us to the Sunnah, is read Riyadh al Salihin. Riyadh al Salihin, MashaAllah. The book was authored with the same purpose and intent, Fada al A'mal, along with encouraging people. But, alhamdulillah, Imam al Nawawi, Rahmatullah alayhi, Muhaddith. And for the most part, for the most part, <coughs> the book, the hadith in there are sahih. Just like the 40 hadith. This hadith, by the way, we're going over tonight, is considered to be a big reference when it comes to fadal a'mal. The fadal, the virtues of a'mal. And while I'm on this topic, let me just say something else. Since we're talking about it, let's just say it. There are some, a group of Muslims, they categorize ilm in two categories. They say ilm al-masail and ilm al-fadail. This taqseem is wrong. The scholars of old, they didn't do that. And so what they do, they talk a lot about the fada'il, and they don't talk about al-masail, the halal and the haram. Right? They say, Muslims today, we don't need to know halal and haram. We need, to, we need encouragement, we need uh, motivation. But if you look at many of the hadith of the Prophet wherein where in our masail, there also is a mentioning of what? Al-fada'il. The Prophet ﷺ didn't separate these two. So why are we separating them? There's no need to separate them. Okay, I have a question. The ayat is he's not agree this. The Quran ayat is not agree this. He's not Muslim. So I follow. How do I follow him? Let me let me say, Sheikh. This person who is this person who is upon this way, he doesn't outwardly reject this ayah. He rejects the ayah based upon a wrong understanding and a misinterpretation. And so, therefore, we as Ahl Sunnah, we don't make takfir on him until and unless we have what We establish the proof, and that comes with. Uh, a dialogue and communication with a lot of these people. Uh, let me just say this, let me be very clear. There are many Muslim brothers and sisters out there who have a lot of wrong things with them. But they don't believe that they're wrong. They believe that they're doing something right. This is why al-bid'ah, as the Salaf used to say, is worse than the other sins. And ma'asiyah, if you steal, if you commit fornication, if you lie, you know you're doing wrong. So even after you do it, you say, stop. I gotta stop this, I gotta stop this. You know you're doing wrong. Like in al-bid'ah, the bid'ah, you don't think you're doing wrong, you think you, you're doing it to get closer to Allah. Thing, yeah. So why would you stop? <laughs> you're not gonna stop the bid'ah. You're gonna, if anything, you're gonna do more. So with these brothers and sisters, this is important when talking about it, as people who ascribe to Sunnah, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided and enlightened to know what is halal, what is haram, no Sunnah, bid'ah, with us, we should not approach them as if they are kuffar. We should approach them as they are Muslim brothers who are very grossly misinformed. And we have to approach, and even when we talk to them, we have to talk to them like the way you would talk to someone when you care about him, because he's our Muslim brother. Yes, brother. In short, could you please explain a little bit the um, difference between Kharijis and Ahlul Sunnah? Ah. Zakhullah Khair. A brother asked, could we mention something? What is the difference between Al Khawarij and Ahlul Sunnah? Al Khawarij is one of the earliest sects that appeared. They appeared during the time of the Sahaba. And the Khawarij, they looked at things in terms of black and white. You're either here or you're there. And so they made tech fear on Muslims. If you did a major sin, they said he's a Catholic. 
If you lie, you still, you're a Catholic. Why? They said because uh, they bring some ayat from Quran, they bring some ahadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ negated iman. For example, the hadith, La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibba li nafsi. When they hear this type of hadith, they say, what? If you don't want for your brother what you want for yourself, then to kafir, you're a disbeliever. Ahl Sunnah don't interpret this hadith this way. So in short, we believe that a person can have some beliefs, as long as those beliefs don't take him kharijan min al they don't, yani it's not kufr al-akbar, some statements even, there are some statements that some people utter, the statements themselves are kufr. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, for example, he said about the one who says the Qur'an is created, he said whoever says the Qur'an is created is a what? Kafir. But he never made takfir on the ruler who believed that it was why. Because there's a difference between making a general statement regarding an action and making a specific ruling about a particular person. In order to make a a, a, a ruling on a particular person, there are certain dawabit, there are guidelines, regulations that have to be met in order to do that. And that's very, very important to make this distinction. This is why Ibn Taymiyyah said, he said, Ahl Sunnah, A'lamu nas bil haq wa arhamuhum bil khalq. Ahl Sunnah are the most knowledgeable of the people concerning the truth, and yet at the same time, they are the most merciful of the people towards the people. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he didn't make takfir on uh, many of his contemporary people, uh, who, opponents. In fact, many people don't know, Ibn Taymiyyah subhanAllah rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah reward that man tremendously. Many people don't know what that man went through in his life. You know, one time Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah was walking down the street and one of the scholars, contemporary scholars who disliked him, they jumped him, they beat him down. They beat him senseless. And Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, when that person became uh, ill and sick, he visited that man and he was very, very kind to this person. Prophet ﷺ was like this. Our Prophet ﷺ was like this. Look at that woman who used to put uh, this stuff in his walkway to inconvenience him. And then when she was missing for some days and he didn't, he inquired about her well-being and he said that she was sick. And he went and inquired about her and this woman became Muslim. Sorry, is, this is authentic? The story about the... Uh, yeah. About the... the yeah, yeah. The old lady. The lady putting garbage in his way. Yeah. From what I know, it's authentic. It's authentic? There is two no. stories. One, yes. one that is not um, fabricated. Uh -huh. Another one about Umar Jamil. Uh -huh. There was some rewire about Umar Jamil. Uh -huh. That's, uh, Umm Jamil, the wife of uh, uh, Abu Lahab. al muhim what's important is that the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't, and he, the way he dealt with the people, even... Oh, Shaykh, I'm asking about the, which one you say, about the old lady, she put most of time, mm. the very stuff or uh -huh. some, what is the part? Something uh, in the history, yeah, in the way, in its path. This hadith from. is um, authentic, or that's, yes. that's not even hadith. It is like a kind of story. Whether they made it, this kind of story. Like it's a kind of story. Yeah. So because, so this is kind of story and Sufism. Sufism few people that they made it. Yeah. Tell you. There is no hadith, uh, authentic hadith. A lot of um, uh, shaykh. Uh, I they say it's weak. Uh, yeah. Even with this, there's nothing in it as it relates to aqidah or shirk or anything of this nature. Yeah, the point is here is in terms of how do you deal with people who oppose you? Yeah, people who uh, show adawa, enmity towards you. The Prophet Sallallahu he never sought revenge for his own personal self, his own per yeah, When the religion is being violated, yeah, mashallah, we see his ghira comes out, but for his own self, he didn't do it. And when it comes to people who are upon other than Sunnah, even if they have bid'ah, even if they have some some shirkiyat with them, what I'm saying is, is as long as they said that they are Muslim, and no no scholar has made established proof on that person, don't deal with him as if he is a Catholic. That's the point. Deal with him as if he is a, a grossly misinformed Muslim. 
and educate him and teach him. And this is one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Shaykh ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he used to send large sums of money to other countries to help people. And people would say, Ya Shaykh, some of these people you send in money to, they have a lot of mukhalafat. And he said, we, we tolerate them. And he used to say, a little bit of Islam is better than no Islam. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this idea that if someone is not on the sunnah, khalas, forget them. And, and, no, no, that's not what we're about. And so, many, pe many people have that understanding about salafiyah. So, so, so uh, yes, uh, I heard about salafi alim. They say, you cannot help the bidati and shiriki alim, you know, no help with their institution or whatever they have. I agree. Because they establish this bida and whatever they are trying to establish. Mm -hmm. I so agree. You cannot help them. You, uh, but with the question wasn't shirk. about helping them. The question wasn't about helping them. The question was about salah behind it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he has a risala specifically on this issue. Uh, uh, the ruling concerning the salah behind a muqtadi. And of course, the muqtadi are of two types. Bid'ah is the bid'ah mukaffira, the one that take you out of Islam, and the bid'ah ghayr mukaffira. Obviously, if someone is worshipped, if they have graves in the masjid, they, they, obviously you cannot pray there. La yaju is not permissible ever. Right? But some of these groups, some of these people, they don't have the grave in the masjid. You understand what I'm saying? All I'm saying is, in terms of making takfir, as Brother Nu'man asked me to mention, what is the difference between Ahl Sunnah and the Khawarij? We're not quick to make takfir to say that a person is a kafir. That statement to say so and so is a kafir is different if he's already a kafir. He's a kafir. We say it about him. But someone who has, yeah, he says, I'm a Muslim, to make takfir on a Muslim is not something easy. And not just anybody goes and does it. Right? Even Ibn Arabi, before the scholars made takfir on him, he was brought before uh, the, the court, the Qabi. They asked him, what is it that you're saying? That's all I'm saying. There's a question I want to deal with, inshallah, before we end uh, tonight's this class. And that is, I'm going to ask you the question. I just want to see what your thoughts are. <coughs> Which is better? A rich, a wealthy person who is thankful? Or a, pro, a poor person who is grateful? One is person and one is uh, uh, rich person who is thankful. Personally, for someone who wants to go to Jannah, for him it will be poor is good. Now, if someone wants to help the Ummah, then that, that is the rich person who can help the Ummah. MashaAllah, Brother Nu'ma, he is he, smart. He didn't just. Yeah, he, most of these questions, they're not. There is no. There's tafsir. There's details in the answer. You don't. You don't just say yay or nay. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I want to hear your thoughts. If you have, a, if you have an opinion, who is better? Ayyuhuma afdal, the rich person who is shakir, who's grateful, <coughs> or al faqir, the poor person who is sabir, who is patient. If we think poor is sabir, which one? That one is mostly, if we think that is better than the rich one. Okay. Poor person. The poor person. I was gonna say, you know, if a person is poor, no matter how much they try, that it could be a test from Allah. You know, like with being poor. Mm. So they, they should be good. But, uh, then again, like uh, Allah could test you with like wealth, and to see if you would still be thankful and remember. Him. So I'm not sure. No. Okay. I ask the question just to draw your attention in, inshallah. <coughs> Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Sheikh was the, who was the Grand Mufti the, uh, before Ibn Baz. Right, right now, Shaykh, Saad, uh, Shaykh Abdul Aziz al-Sheikh, before him was Shaykh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz. Before Shaykh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz was Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Sheikh. This man, mashallah, he was, he, was, he was the teacher of Shaykh ibn Baz. He said, he said that poverty and being wealthy, neither one of these things are praiseworthy in and of themselves. 
pay very close attention to what I'm about to say. See, rulings, ahkam in Islam, they don't have to do with things. They have to do with sayings and actions. The hukum is connected to the saying and the action, not the thing. For example, someone said, it's alcohol haram. You should, you should say, what do you mean by that? Because alcohol, the thing, is not haram. Consuming alcohol is haram. The ruling is, is associated with the action, not the thing. The shaykh, he says that Al-Faqr wa Tharwa laysa bi'ibadah Poverty and being wealthy is, these things are not worship. He said, فَأَفْضَلْ كُلِّ جَنْسِ مَنِ اتَّقُ اللَّهِ مَنِ اتَّقُ اللَّهِ The better of both is whoever is in those situations who has taqwa of Allah. That's the one who is better. During that situation, whether it is in poverty, whether it is in wealth. And he said, so in other words, just because someone is poor, that doesn't make him better than someone who is rich. And if someone is rich, that doesn't necessarily make him better than the one who is poor. The thing, the deciding factor is the taqwa. And the reason I'm saying that, and this is directly related to the hadith, because those sahaba, those poor muhajirun who was asking the question, they, they saw themselves as being deficient because they did not possess a lot of wealth. The Prophet ﷺ, however, explained to them that Allah has also given you that which you can do uh, sadaqah with. So this is very, very important. Um, no matter what you are, if you are a poor person, you should have taqwa, right? And how you get your money, how you spend your money. If you are a wealthy person, you should have taqwa. And yes, you should be thankful and you should spend it fisabilillah on the good causes. And that's another thing, if you're wealthy and you don't spend uh, for the sake of Allah, yani the only thing, the only wealth that is going to really benefit you is the one you spend on that which is good. You're not going to go into the grave with it. You can't take it with you. You ain't going to take nothing with you. All you, you. You're not even taking your clothes. Right? This is just a side issue. Brothers and sisters, I just want to say as an encouragement for myself and you are not just doing these days. We have to leave the we can't, we have to stop being those type of people who we only think about doing good during the, the seasons of goodness. No, we should be doing more during those times. But we have to be in the habit of doing good all the time and really encouraging our families to do these things. Dhikr of Allah, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen said, he said, this is something that's so easy and so simple, but yet, the only one who does it is the one Allah give tawfiq. It's the only one Allah give tawfiq. Something so easy, it takes very, very little effort. But how many of us make dhikr of Allah regularly in his day, in the masjid, in the car? What do we do? We play in the radio. We listen into garbage. Trump, all his whole ordeal, garbage, waste. It doesn't increase your iman. It didn't do anything for your Islam, anything for your Akhirah. Wasting time. Wasting time. That last hadith, towards the end of the hadith, what did the Prophet say? He said, whoever finds good, huh? let him thank Allah. And whoever finds other than that, then let him what? Let him not blame anyone but his own self. And then Anubi brings this hadith. This hadith, if we understand this hadith, truly understand it well, inshallah, we should be able to profit a lot in, in, in very, very easily. Even if you don't have a lot of wealth. Even if you don't have a lot of wealth. Uh, with that being said, uh, the Imam wanted me to say a couple of things about, uh, oh wait, the hadith about 100, reward for praying in Masjid Haram, 100,000. Is it only cause for Fard Salah or, oh, mashallah. Someone is asking the question, if you were in Haram, Mecca, the hadith that says you get 100,000 for each Salah, the question is asked, is it just for the obligatory prayer or is it general? We say it's general. It's not just for the obligatory prayer because the hadith, the, the Prophet said in the hadith, man salla salatan, with the tanween. He didn't say man salah as salah. 
had it had the alif lam as salah then then we can understand from it it's talking about the obligatory prayer but when he said salatan it's general that is that is umum that means whether it's farad or nafila so that hundred thousand is applicable to whether it's the obligatory prayer whether it's the nafila prayer and also what if I didn't, I didn't understand um, this other question. Uh, to adding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam name in our Udhiyah. Adding his name in our Udhiyah? Yeah, that No, we don't, we don't add his name in our Udhiyah. When you're slaughtering, Bismillah Allahu Akbar. Bismillah Allahu Akbar. No, no, you know, the, the seven name we add, uh, you know, a big animal. One share for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some people does that. Okay, one share for, for one share for the prophet. Name. Oh no, no. Yeah. Some people do that. Yeah, we used to know this one. Uh, okay. Have to wood, but uh, yesterday I heard the chef say uh, the prophet gave wasia to add his name because the ten military. No, no. So the question is, is when you slaughter, you make a portion for the prophet You don't got to do anything. Everything we do, the prophet is going to get an uh, edge for it. Yeah. Because he said, Whoever guides or directs someone to some good, this hadith is Sahih Muslim, he's just like the one who did that good. Every time we perform salah, every time we fast, every time we do hajj, the Prophet ﷺ is given a share of all of that without there being any decrease. So we don't need to uh, designate, specify a portion for the Prophet. ﷺ. It's a good question. Um, with regard to tonight, now that Maghrib has, uh, Maghrib has entered, we are officially in Dhul Hijjah. Anyone who intends to slaughter, they're not allowed to cut their nails, no pedicures, no manicures, nor are they allowed to cut their hair. Whether it's the hair on the head or hair from any other part of the body, to remove anything from the body. Should I please start today? Yeah, it starts now. What about the kids? So, good question. This is a good question. I mean, some my wife fighting to the kids. I said she said after that. So the 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 one who is actually slaughtering, who who has the knife in his hand, is this is the one who cannot cut his hairs and cannot uh, cut his uh, nails. And this is in the book. Inshallah, I'm gonna. Brother Norman has access to it. Maybe we share it in the group. There's a book by Ibn Rufaymeen just on slaughtering. It's a short book. It's no more than 60 pages. It gives you all the rules related to the, the, the slaughtering. As the Imam said, there is no amal salih without ilm al nafi. There is no righteous deeds without beneficial knowledge. Before you go to slaughter, you really should be familiar with what is the sunnah regarding slaughter. Because many people every year when we go to these places and we go to slaughter, we see things that are very, very wrong, opposition to the sunnah. Uh, we, in terms of the animal itself, some people don't even care what kind of animal they pick. The animal has some, some, uh, some serious, it looks like it's sick, things like this. Or maybe the animal is not uh, old enough, right? People are sharpening the, the, the knives in front of the animal. They're slaughtering the animals in front of the other animals. I grant it, some places you, you can't get around it. But you try your best to follow the sunnah as much as you are able to in these places. Um, and then also keep in mind, when we do the slaughtering, you have the day of Eid and you also have the days of the, the Ayyam and Tashrik. You can slaughter in those days as well. Allah made it easy for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for us. It can be done in those days. Um, yes, you had your hand up. Uh, quick question. Uh, just uh, for a recap. Uh, what were the most beloved words to Allah again? The most be it's in your handout too. The most beloved words to Allah are four. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. 
And, and by the way, this here shows that those people, we said it before, those people who do dhikr by saying Allah who or who who, this is incorrect. You won't find anywhere in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ where he did dhikr that way. The dhikr of the Prophet ﷺ always involved mentioning Allah's name, right? His name. And, and usually the name is attached to something like Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. You don't find Allah, 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 Allah like this. Uh, there are some people, Audhu Billah, they say that La ilaha illallah, this is the dhikr for Al Awam, the general people. I'm not going to mention the person who said this. But they say that this is the common dhikr, these dhikr that we say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. But, the, but there's a dhikr that is superior to that, and it is Allahu. There's no hadith to support that. It's wrong. The Sufis say, but there's a particular. Yeah, they say some just say who who, some say Allah who, Allah who, Allah who, or they just do who 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 or who. This is all wrong. This is all wrong. You won't find any hadith like this where the Prophet sallallahu did dhikr this way. And some of them, they they even use some terms that they have like that. one guy, he he he. Uh, he used the term Badduh. Ya Badduh. Ya Badduh. That's not even our name of Allah. Yeah. So, the point is here, this hadith, the, the question the brothers is asked, what is the most beloved kalam to Allah? This is a, these are the best adhkar. Do you not see, even in the salah, in, uh, in Rukur, in Rukur, what are we saying? Subhana Rabbi al Azim. And in Sajda, Subhana Rabbi al A'la. Right? And, and coming up from uh, report, Samia Allahu Liman Hamida. Right? Allah responds to the one who praises Him. So the Sunnah is very clear on this. We have other things like La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu al mulku wa lahu al hamdu wa hu ala kulli shayin qadir. Adkar. Or uh, astaghfirullah. This is another important one that no, Muslim, and no day should go by. The Muslim, he is not making istighfar. Right? The book, Hisnul Muslim, we talk about it. You, every Muslim, every brother should have that. Every sister should have that. If need, if need be, mashallah, may Allah reward the, the Imam, rahmatullah alayh. It's pocket size. You can even put it in your pocket and carry it around with you. And, and memorize those adhkar. Mashallah, it's very, very beneficial. But um, there are adhkar and there are ad'iyah that are said at certain times. And then there are certain adhkar and ad'iyah that are said during all times. Even these days, right now. Ayyam al-Ashr, we have what's called the, the, the takbir al-mutlaq and the takbir al-muqayyad. The, 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 the takbir that is done at all times and then the one that is restricted to after the uh, as-salawat, right? So, inshallah, I'm sure the Imam, he will talk about these things. Jazakallah khairan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. I also noticed that many of you got this book, but I don't see you bring it to class. It's in the bag. You should bring it to class, and you should you should read it before coming to class. So this is Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Abbas' explanation. Read it before coming to class because it's going to give you an idea of already what we're going to talk about in class. You will may even formulate some questions, and in the class you will see that we answered the question. But this is this is a request from me to you. If you have it, please bring it to the class. And two, before the class, read the hadith. That whatever hadith we're going to go over, read the hadith, inshallah. Read the hadith. Jazakumullah khairan, subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ilaha ta astaghfiru wa tubu. Whatever I said is the haq. I thank Allah if I made any errors. May Allah forgive me.